The Ascendant Quran, Realigning Man to the Divine Power Culture. The first ever tafsir written directly in English by one of the best known Quran scholars in North America, Imam Muhammad al -Asi. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Zafar Bangash, welcome to Muslim Perspectives. We continue our discussion about various concepts in the Noble Quran with Imam Muhammad al Asi, who is the Mufassir, that means he is writing the tafsir of the Noble Quran. The title of this tafsir is The Ascendant Quran Realigning Man to the Divine Power Culture. Brother Muhammad, welcome back to the program. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me over. The Quran uses two different expressions, uh, one is Muslim, the other is Mu'min. Why these two different expressions and is there a difference in their meaning? Well, uh, the difference we can ascertain from the Quran itself, the ayat in the Quran, let me probably by way of uh, reference say that uh, the word Iman and its derivatives in the Qur'an is mentioned more than the word Muslim and its derivatives in the Qur'an. And there is, um, uh, we can put it this way, every mu'min is a Muslim, but not every Muslim is a mu'min. Um, when we observe the ayat of the Qur'an uh, that are worded with, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O you who are uh, committed to Allah. Uh, in the overwhelming majority of the time, what follows this expression, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, is some type of obligation. For example, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, kutiba alaykum as يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الْقِتَالِ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَوْفُوا بِالْعُقُودِ So there's always some type of responsibility that follows يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا When we look at the word Muslim and its derivatives in the Qur'an, either أَسْلَمُوا or أَسْلِمُوا or مُسْلِمُون, etc. We don't find that it is followed by uh, a task. <clears throat> and so what emerges from comparing these two um, discourses in the Qur'an, the one about uh, Iman and the other one about Islam, is that الَّذِينَ <clears throat> amanu or Iman, by necessity, um, produces action, and that action is obviously in conformity with Allah and His Prophet. Ya yu aladina amanu atiyu Allah wa atiyu Rasul. Another one of ya yu aladina amanu. Whereas an ayah, I reckon it's in Surah Al Hujurat, it says. وَقَالَتِ الْأَعْرَابُ آمَنَّا This is where we can bring the two words in one ayah. وَقَالَتِ الْأَعْرَابُ آمَنَّا The Arabian Bedouins said, but we are mu'mins. We also have committed ourselves to Allah. قُلْ And the response to that was, قُلْ Say, O Prophet, to them, to these Arabian Nomads, Lam tu'minu. You haven't committed yourselves. Walakin qulu aslamna. Rather say, we are Muslims. So, when you, and this is in response, this ayah and this characterization of the status of these Bedouins who just became Muslims 
was that you, know, you haven't reached the level of commitment along with which comes conforming action. وَلَكِنْ قُولُوا أَسْلَمْنَا وَلَمَّا يَدْخُلِ الْإِيمَانُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ The Iman has not yet settled into your hearts. So this, in, and there's another aspect to this, which I think many people are not aware of. This, I'm here strictly speaking at the academic or scholarly level, but when you come to, um, let's say, the legal or the administrative level, uh, Iman is a feature or a characterization that, you know, in today's world, what we have is, especially in the English, I'm sure this exists in other languages also, because the uh, English language, because it is associated with power centers in the world, sets the pace for other peoples and their languages. So in today's world, uh, for those who speak English, of course, they've, there's a new word that's been coined, which did not exist in its meaning, in the current meaning, a hundred years ago, or more than that. But it just right now gained new um, dimensions. And that word is Islamists. That word Islamists, even though in many of the um, commentaries and the uh, written material, uh, this word tends to have, most of the times, a negative connotation. Or he's, uh, you know, they say uh, these people who write these things and discourse on them, obviously most of them are not Muslims, they say, you know, we're all right with a Muslim, but we're not all right with an Islamist. The word Islamist here, even though it's meant to take away from the positive features of a committed Muslim, that word is defining those Muslims who are involved in the higher responsibilities that are peculiar to a mu'min. So it, 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 even the usage of the word in English has had its influence even in the Arabic language. Because we, I, I, I read a lot, uh, many, many writers and um, scholars who use the word Islamist in Arabic. They say Islamiyun instead of saying Mu'min. So um, uh, in, the, in the administrative realm of things, uh, Muslim becomes if we're looking at civil society, Muslim becomes something like a citizenship. If someone is subject to an Islamic authority, there's an Islamic government, their citizenship is an Islamic citizenship even though their faith or their creed may be non-Islamic. So let's say there's a, um, a person who is born in an Islamic state in an Islamic jurisdiction, that person, even though he may be Christian or Jew or Buddhist or whatever, is a Muslim. In the civic sense, you mean? In the civic sense of the word, he's a Muslim. He or she is a Muslim. But we can't say he or she is a mu'min because they don't carry that res those responsibilities that are outlined in the Qur'an whenever the word Iman, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Al-amal al-salih, as defined by Allah and His Prophet, is a component of this Iman. And here's where some confusion settles in, because in the English language, Iman is uh, translated as belief or faith. And that, it, that certainly is not the meaning of it in the Qur'anic Arabic language. 
So th these are some of the distinctions I, I thought I'd throw out there. And now, despite the Quranic designation uh, for us as Muslims or mu'mins, um, there are so many new designations and labels that have come about, Shias and Sunnis, and these are also divided into different uh, sub-designations, etc. How did these come about? Well, the way this began, uh, during the time of Allah's Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him and his, uh, there was no reference to anything besides these two words, Mu'min and Muslim within the um, circle of um, uh, an Islamic way of life. What happened though after the Prophet passed away, uh, there were some political disagreements among that first generation of Muslims. Those political disagreements um, broke down mainly into three categories. The first one is called Shia or Tashayyur. The second one is called uh, the Khawarij. And the third one, and this is in, in their uh, uh, historical sequential order, the third one became known as Ahl al-Sunnah wal-Jama'ah. And this, as I said, is attributable to um, basically the um, ijtihad of who is the uh, qualified leader to lead the Muslim society and the Muslim state after the passing away of Allah's most beloved prophet. This is where these words came into usage. Now, I know there are different historical explanations for exactly when and by whom did these designations um, begin. Um, because, for example, al-Khawarij, I'll, I'll use the word al-Khawarij, and not Sunni and Shia, so that because I know most of those who, the Muslims who are listening, are either quote-unquote Sunnis or quote-unquote Shias. But I doubt if anyone listening is going to be from the Khawarij, so that's why I'm using this as an example. Uh, Al-Khawarij were known by two other designations. One of them is called Al-Haruriya, and the other one is called Al-Qurra. Al-Haruriya is in relationship to a town that was in the vicinity of Al-Basra in southern Iraq, where they had concentrated their presence or their leadership. Uh, Al-Qurra is another name given to them, uh, Al-Qurra is the plural of Qari, and that's in reference to the uh, uh, reading and the understanding of the Qur'an. But those two designations did not live on. No one today calls them Al-Haruriya, and no one today calls them Al-Qurra. Everyone calls them Al-Khawarij. The reason why the word Al-Khawarij survived all of these centuries is, is because it wasn't a reference to their geographical location, nor a reference to their scholarly um, uh, level. Rather, it was a reference to their political position. Al-Khawarij is a word uh, in Arabic which means dissidents. So, because they broke away from uh, Al-Imam Ali, they took uh, issue with his position. That breaking away from him uh, was called al-Khawarij. So it is the political designation that survived all of these centuries up until this very day. Many people refer to them as al-Khawarij. Of course, some of them call them uh, by one of the schools of thought that survived. They had over a couple of dozen schools of thought, but the one that today is the predominant one is the Ibadiyya, the Ibadis, 
and so many people today refer to them as Ibadis instead of Khawarij. But the Ibadis do not carry the same uh, negative connotations as the label uh, the Khawarij does. Isn't, isn't that the case? Well, because they were the, the mildest, so to speak, of the, uh, compared to the other 20 or 25 uh, schools of thought that they had at that time, they were the least confrontational. The most confrontational died off, the least confrontational lived on. And so at Libavis, in comparison to the other internal Khariji schools of thought, were the most uh, conciliatory, and so uh, they, uh, they survived, and they, 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 they're concentrated today in Oman and in parts of uh, North Africa. I don't know exactly what their numbers may be. My guess would probably be about seven or eight million, but... Are there any Khawarij or their equivalent uh, in the world today? Uh, as a continuum, no. Um, I'm talking about in the political sense, as a continuum. I mean, we're, if we're talking about that opposition that began by them first against Imam Ali, alayhi salam, then second against the Umawis, Muawiyah and that whole dynasty. Uh, that opposition uh, does not exist today. It, was, it wasn't a continuous opposition against the different dynasties that came after the Umawis, such as the Abbasis, or the Mamlukis, or the Fatimis, or the Uthmanis, or the Safawis, or they, there was no opposition from, I mean, there may have been individuals who theoretically held on to an opposition point of view, but that opposition was not an armed or quote-unquote violent opposition as it was during the first generations of al-Khawarij. So what were the circumstances in which this concept Ahl-Sunnah wal-Jama'ah emerged? It emerged actually um, when events took a turn to the worst in the battle between al-Imam Ali and King Muawiyah. When that happened uh, and um, in the Battle of Safin, um, there was um, a gesture expressed by Muawiyah and Amr ibn al-As uh, to settle the differences between the two sides with reliance upon the Qur'an instead of by armed conflict. And this is known as Raf al-Masahif, when they they put the uh, uh, pages of the Qur'an up on their swords and they say, we seek arbitration. Uh, did this occur at the time when Muawiyah and his army were on the verge of uh, defeat? Yes, the Muawiyah and his camp were losing the battle. And um, that was a ploy to... Um, deceive those who were in the opposing camp, meaning in Imam Ali's camp. You mentioned this expression, Ahl Sunnah wal Jamaat. Uh, what I'd like to know, and I'm sure our viewers would like to know is, uh, did this concept exist at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or at the time of the Khulafa al Rashidun? Yeah, so when this happened, and they went through all of that arbitration. And Imam Ali was assassinated. And uh, Imam Al-Hasan, Imam Ali's son, reached a type of agreement with Muawiyah, which Muawiyah did not live by. He later on violated that agreement. But when Muawiyah, after Imam Al-Hasan uh, passed on, and Muawiyah declared himself the leader of the Muslims, he said, this year, when he became the leader of Muslims, this is the year of the people of Sunnah and Jama'a. Now, how would you put it in the language of an average person? 
Well, you know, at that time, it meant this is the year when we, we're finally consolidating our power. And um, so uh, those who are in my camp now uh, are known by Ahl al-Sunnah wal-Jama'ah. Of course, this flies in the face of the fact that Muawiyah spent most of his life uh, along with his father and the other clannish heads in Mecca, fighting against Allah's Prophet, fighting against al-Sabiqeen, al-Ansar, al-Muhajireen, doing all of this. He sort of stole the show in the political sense and imposed that designation on the overwhelming majority of Muslims who were, in, in a sense, um, non-committed to the warfare that was going on. And he stole that. It's like they were the silent majority. That's one of the use, words used. He stole the silent majority, designated them since that time to be Ahl al-Sunnah wal jamaah And that silent majority has not politically activated its mind to revisit what happened initially at that time so that it can either redesignate itself or if it wants to stay with that designation ahl sunnah wal, uh, wal jamaa to expel muawiyah from that designation because he doesn't in in fact and in reality he doesn't belong to uh, al jamaa and he doesn't belong to the sunnah of the prophet would you say that those people that uh, became Muslims, or at least the elite from among them, uh, at the time of the liberation of Makkah, uh, they became Muslims uh, for political reasons rather than a genuine commitment to Islam, to the Quran, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Well, yes. The uh, you see, Mecca was in opposition psychological, social, economic, political, and military opposition to the Prophet ever since he became Allah's Prophet. And when after 20 years of this struggle between Allah's Prophet and the Muhajireen and Ansar on one hand, and the people or the bastion of Mecca on the other hand, the people in Mecca after Al Hudaybiyah realized that Islam is the wave of the future. We we were fighting for the past two decades a lost battle. And now is the time to deal with reality, this up and coming Islam. And we fought it and lost. So now we're gonna to have to become Muslims. This was not done by and large. I mean, there are probably some individuals who are the exceptions here. But the majority of these people, when the Prophet returned to Mecca, he said, he said to them, what do you think I'm, I'm about to do with you? These are people who fought him for 20 years, uh, over 20 years. And they, 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 they probably in themselves knew his character. So they said... Uh, Akhun Karim wa bin Akhun Karim. Well, you're, you're a brother and a nephew. It's like saying, well, you're one of us. This is how, after 20 years of bloodshed and warfare and the sacrifices and struggle, and they're saying they're coming right now with a, um, a sweet tongue uh, approaching them. But of course, he told them, You are free to go now, you are released. You know, meaning I'm not taking you prisoners of war. By any standard, they should have been prisoners of war. But the Prophet, in his character, in his mannerism, sublime as it is, told them, you can go, you're free now. Uh, so these were the ones who became Muslims because they felt that there's no other choice. There's no other way to go. And they became Muslims. Some of them are called, uh, I mean, th these are called at tulaqa That means? Uh, uh, tulaqa is plural. Taliq is one. And taliq is one who's been freed, released 
from captivity or from um, a prison sentence or whatever. Is the word uh, talaq related to it? Uh, no, no. Uh, talaq comes from talaqa. This comes from atlaqa. Okay. These are two, two different things. Yeah. So um, another proportion of these people who are not solidly on the side of Allah's Prophet are called Al-A'rab. They later on became Muslims in the last year or two of the Prophet's life. These cannot be um, included in the word Sahaba. You see, most of the problems that we Muslims today in this uh, charged atmosphere of sectarianism much of the problem comes from uh, a type of fanaticism that is um, concentrated in and around the word uh, Sahaba. And this word Sahaba has to be refined because it has different definitions. Uh, Brother Muhammad, I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today. We'll have to uh, stop at this point, but I'd like to thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. We are very grateful, uh, and I'm sure that our viewers would have found uh, your explanations uh, extremely helpful and enlightening. Thank you very much. Sure. My pleasure. Uh, that's all the time we have for today. You have been watching Muslim Perspectives, and my guest has been Imam Muhammad al-Asi, who is the Mufassir of the Noble Quran. The title of this tafsir is The Ascendant Quran, Realigning Man to the Divine Power Culture. It's available from Crescent International. Our address is PO Box 747, Gormley, Ontario, and the postal code is L0H1G0. Uh, each volume is $30, including postage anywhere in North America. There are eight volumes available at the present time. The ninth volume is in the press, and the tenth is being worked on. If you'd like to order your copies, you could do so by either contacting us by mail or email us at uh, info.isyr at gmail.com. The email address again, it will be on your screen as well, info.isyr at gmail.com or you can even call us at 905-887-8913. Uh, you've been watching Muslim Perspectives. I'm Zafar Bangash. Thank you for watching. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. <laughs>